Vic Galloway on BBC Radio Scotland. I'm Vic Galloway, this is BBC Radio Scotland and BBC Sounds. Welcome Jim and William Reid, the Jesus and Mary chain. Hi, yeah. Hi, Vic. Uh, it's Hi. good to have you here. Probably the most influential band from Scotland in the last 40 years. And I have personally been listening to you since I was about 11, 12 years old. So it's an absolute pleasure to have you here in Glasgow at the BBC Studios. What brings you back to Glasgow? Well, we, we are doing a week of rehearsals and then we are, we are playing a, a show at the end of the week. And we've got a record called uh, Glasgow Eyes, which... We're recording Glasgow. I keep saying Glasgow, but Glasgow. Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're only doing uh, one wee show in Glasgow, Glasgow right now, and um, <laughs> which is kind of annoying because the album's called Glasgow Eyes, and we wanted to kind of start it off in Glasgow, and we couldn't find a place like. Well, there was a bit there. of a mix-up, to be honest. Yeah, was, uh, um, booking agents and promoters. <laughs> So I thought it would be a good idea to, to do Edinburgh this time. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, everybody heard about it, like, what? Yeah, this album's called Glasgow Eyes and you're not playing Glasgow. Yeah, by the time we uh, complained, there wasn't any places to play, like, then, except for the wee place it looks. Anyways, so here we are. Yeah, so Glasgow Eyes, tell us about the title. and it recorded at Mogwai's Castle of Doom Studios, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was recorded in different places, but mm -hmm. it kind of came together as a as an album there. I think back in Glasgow, after like almost forty years, we thought, well, let's have a title that kind of somehow mentions Glasgow one mm -hmm. way or another. And then he was doing all these cover art things for the the album cover, and uh, there was one that well, there's lots with all this messed up eyes and stuff like that and I sort of said that looks like Glasgow eyes. Are they paintings William or are they, is it digital art? Digital art. Right okay. Yeah. I kind of did that during the lockdown when nothing was happening. Mm -hmm. I was incredibly bored. I should have wrote a lot of music but, <laughs> but you have to like get up you know or your bed to make music and with your iPad you can lie back and you know explore uh, the world of graphic art and design and uh, so I did that and found that uh, I wasn't too bad at it. I suppose living in different places, Jim, you're now in the southwest, down sort of Devon area and uh, yeah. William, you and... I live, I live outside the Tucson uh, most of the time and my wife has a house in Dublin. Right. Which is where I've just came from. And in terms of the recording, it's a bit more experimental. You're pushing things out in different sort of ways as well. Uh, tell us what's gone into this record. Well, in a weird way, I think we sound the same as we've always sounded. And then in another weird way, we, we seem to be, you know, pushing forward. I kind of think we've always tried to do that, haven't we, really? I mean, uh, yeah, what, what he says, really. I mean, if it's got the Mary Chain written on the cover, it's going to sound like the Mary Chain. I mean, it's just, I mean, if we made a record with bagpipes, it would sound like a Mary Jane. It's just the way it works. Because it would be us, like, sort of hitting a bagpipe with a hammer or something like that. <laughs> so, I, would, I would like to hear that record, maybe... Well, uh, that's the next record. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Tell us about growing up, going right back to the beginning. Did you grow up in a, a musical household? <laughs> uh, um, no, really. No, not at all. I mean, no. our, our parents were not music. They, they had a, their record collection was about... I don't know, about like three LPs or something like that. Sydney Devine, my dad had Dean Martin or something like that. Jim Reeves. Right, there yeah. you go. People would sing at parties and stuff, <clears throat> get drunk, sing at parties, which I've never done in my life. Have you? Probably, but uh, yeah, let's, let's not talk about you it. sang at a party. <laughs> I've, I've done all sorts of parties. <laughs> okay. Where did all these disparate influences come from then? You're famous for saying that you love the, the Stooges, the Velvet Underground, Shangri-Las, all sorts of stuff went into that early sound. How did you discover that music? I think we kind of dived in with, a, with the Beatles. I mean, he got... He's bitter about this, but I, I thought it was a household... Uh, a record player, but apparently it was his birthday present. Mm -hmm. But he, we got this record player. He got this record player. And it was about 1971, and we had nothing to play on it, and so we borrowed all of these Beatles records from a cousin. Yeah. 
And it was like, that was, I don't, I don't know about you, but it, for me, that was like when I realised that, that this is like something I, that I would want to do. You never really realistically thought you could do it because it's the Beatles. Who can do that? Those records were mostly the uh, the, the early, the mock talk ones, really. Mm. But uh, you know, when you're young, they, they make perfect sense. The seeds were sown. Wanted to be in a group, but I, I, to be honest, I never really thought I would I would ever be good enough. This was pre-punk, because you know all my favourite records were just sounded like just impossible, impossible to like to reach that standard of musicianship. And then I heard the Ramones, and suddenly, you know, in the cartoons, when a, a light bulb, well, just like a thousand light bulbs go off when you hear the Ramones, because the first thing you think is. I can do that, it's easy, which is not. I, I mean, since 76, there's been thousands of bands that try to sound like the Ramones, which is just a bass, a guitar, a drum and a voice, and nobody's ever really got close to that basic, simple sound. We never, we never even got close to it, but it gave us, like, once you learned a bar chord, you could play every punk song in the world. That's your first hurdle you got over, the fact that, you, you know, it's impossible to you. And no, it's not impossible. It's <laughs> difficult, but it's not impossible because these four scruffs from New York did it, you know? And Joey Ramone came here one of our parties once in New York and... Did you speak to him? I was terrified. That really saddened me because, like, you know, we absolutely adored the Ramones, but were just too shy to talk to them. And from that, they they took it that we weren't into them at all. Well, oh. Joey came to one of your parties, and I was just trying to get drunk to talk to him, and I couldn't. <laughs> no matter how, how drunk, I just couldn't talk to him. I just thought, was, Joey Ramones, like, you know, like, just... Pressed a button in my well, my mind. I sat I, I sat next to Dee Dee Ramona at a party. I sat there, I sat next to him all night, and I was like, I was like, sort of trying to pluck out the, the courage to. Talk. I, I felt like Alan Bennett sitting there going, "Ooh, <laughs> give me a jammy, don't you?" <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't. I sat there, and then in the end, he got up and left, and I was like, Oof, "Another one of those."
And what about growing up in East Kilbride as well? Because did that have some kind of impact on you musically? It did, in as much as that we might as well have been living on the moon, if you know what I mean. And I think that kind of alienation kind of gives you a certain sort of desperation and you kind of come up with music or ideas based on that, based on the isolation, really, and it, and it kind of gives it a kind of a outsider's viewpoint, which is what we've had ever since. How did you discover music living in East Kilbride, then? Well, it was radios, you know what I mean? It's not like... We weren't actually on the moon. It was <laughs> actually East Kilbride, you know what I mean? <laughs> but we used to... I mean, we used to lie under the covers on a Sunday night listening to, like, Radio Luxembourg, do you remember me? Yeah. On a wee transistor radio. Mm -hmm. You'd be listening to Roxy Music and all of that. You've got me, girl, on the run around, run around, got me all around town. You've got me, girl, on the run around, and it's get me down. If you want to find a lover, then you look no further, for I'm going to be your only searching at the start of the season, and my only reason is that I what he was saying earlier, like music then was made by like beautiful exotic creatures and you could never actually imagine that that could ever one day be you. And then punk came along and it was like, my God, these people look and sound like us. They're scruffy, you know, it's raw. You know, maybe we could do this. And that, that was the, when, when the idea of being in a band became kind of like a reality or a, a, a serious possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever, like, travel into Glasgow? Or could you afford to, as kids, go into Glasgow and go record shopping or anything like that? He's three years older than me, and in 1977, I was 15 years old, so a trip into Glasgow to me was like a, an expedition, you know what I mean? You'd save up your paper round money and go into Glasgow once every six months. He had a job, so he used to go eat. Punk gigs and all yeah, that. I was a wage, wage slave. If punk was the, the seismic explosion, was the kind of trigger to get you going, when did you actually sort of try and start to write a tune or put something together? Well, the thing about us is we're incredibly lazy. He bought a guitar, a bass guitar, it was in 1977, and it sat in the corner getting all dusty and covered in spider's webs till about, I don't know, about 1982 or something like that. And we just thought, like, we're going to do this, we have to do it. So about five years after punk, got, got in gear a bit more. The idea of a band started to become like a reality. Did you start recording on a four track in your parents' living room? Yeah, well, uh, in our bedroom. Believe it or not, we shared a bedroom. Well, right. we used to have a port studio that we bought for 300 quid because my dad had made redundant. They completely screwed him over, by the way, because what happened is, and my dad was working there so many years, and they only paid a fraction of the redundancy fees. So instead of my dad getting maybe 30 grand or whatever, he got something like three grand. It was ridiculous. But he was good enough to give me and Jim uh, a few hundred quid each, which we bought. We went to Victor Morris. He gave he gave us three hundred quid. Was that each or between us? Between us. And my and my 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 dad. I don't remember. My dad thought we were going to do something useful. <laughs> well, he thought we were going to get driving lessons and a, and a car or something, which was possible for that kind of money back then. But then one day he came back in and we we're sitting with this Porter studio and he's like, "Hey, 
what's that you've got? And I'm going, support the studio. And he was going, oh, right, it's a tape recorder, is it? <laughs> and then he said, what are you going to do with that money? Said, what, what you spent it on this? And he went, you yeah, bloody, you yeah, bumpkins. Yeah. And that was it. He, couldn't, he just could not understand why we would spend this 300 quid on a tape recorder. Did you ever sort of turn around to your dad in years to come and go, we see, did. My, we no, did. My, my dad in years to come sort of said, you were right. You know, mm-hmm. it's like I, did, I, I didn't see it at the time, but I, I see it now. Well, looking at it from, from his point of view, you know, it was a tape recorder and it was 300 quid. And tape recorders were like 11, 8 quid at the time, mm. you know, and so he couldn't really understand. And same with my ma, that it was a four track tape recorder that you could record four tracks, bounce them down, and like maybe have eight guitars playing it, you know, like a. Like, no great quality, but that still didn't impress. Him, for, for, from my dad's point of view, though, it was like, it was a Jack and a Beanstalk moment. You know what I mean? That sent us out with like the three hundred quid, and we can buy it with these magic beans. Mm-hmm. And he was just looking at us, saying, you "Bloody idiots!" Do you know what I mean? How are these guys going to survive it? You know? What were those first experiments like on the four track then? Experimental. <laughs> were they songs? Uh, some of them were like. I remember, like, just another junta. Oh, right, right. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. I wrote that. Just another junta. And and then the, the echo would go, junta, ah, 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 just another junta. It was our cabaret Voltaire face. Yeah, yeah we're, so were you listening to stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, I still love cabaret Voltaire, mm-hmm. actually. Mm-hmm. Post-punk, I suppose, what were you sort of digging into musically then? Joy Public Division. Image Limited, yeah. New Order, Joy Division. In fact, I think New Order Joy Division was another big re- revelation because the riffs were so simple, mm. just so simple and basic, but incredibly, incredibly catchy. Like when I first started playing guitar, I, wanted, I always wanted my songs to be filled with what I'd hear in the Stones and all the other songs, like little guitar licks, and I couldn't do them. And when I heard like uh, Joy Division, uh, New Order realised that I could do it.
there's a great interview. I'm glad that you've said you both like Joy Division because there's a great interview. I know I've what seen. you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> when you were interviewed, can, can I, Jim. Right, you tell the story and I'll explain why it happened. Basically, an interviewer, I think it's in Europe, asks you if you like if you're fans of Joy Division and you say that they're terrible and that blah 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 blah. It, well, it's a combination of a, a couple of different things. It's like I was a complete idiot back then, and I used to enjoy upsetting people. But somebody said, just before the interview, somebody said, whatever you do, don't say anything bad about Joy Division, because this guy's a massive Joy Division fan. <laughs> so that, that was it. You know, I thought, OK. <laughs> Went out there and just said, pure poison about Joy Division. And the poor guy looked like he was going to have a heart attack. So job done. That was it. That, that was my job. The, the demo tape, I suppose, would have come out of that four track recorder which is that the it was it was sent to various people no one really picked up on it except Bobby Gillespie uh, yeah what it was was we, we were trying to get a gig we couldn't get a gig in Glasgow anywhere and we, I, we we gave this tape to somebody that was running a club in a sucky old street and they didn't they weren't interested and it was a demo tape the guy happened to be a mate of Bobby's there happened to be a Sid Barrett compilation that we'd recorded on the other side of that tape. So he said, the guy said, Hey, Bobby, you like Sid Barrett? There's a Sid Barrett tape. And luckily, Bobby turned it over and played our music. Still had the phone number on it, and he phoned us up. And uh, that was it. The rest is history. He said, my mate, McGee, London, blah, 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 and we played a gig. You went down to, to play Alan McGee's club, The Living Room, mm. and um, as legend goes, he signed you in the sound check, or at least approached you in the sound check. Well, I mean, you have to remember, so you're saying signed us in the sound check. I mean, Alan was a guy that worked for British Rail, <laughs> and, it, and it, 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 Creation was like his spare bedroom. That was Creation Records. So, you know, yeah, he said, let's do multiple albums. Like, to us, it was mind-blowing anyway. But um, it was very small scale, and I, I dare say that I'm not being... Big-headed when I say that it was actually that record that we recorded with Alan to put Creation Records on the map. The thing that you were most famous for initially was the squealing feedback, as well as the great tunes, obviously. But why bring in that level of white noise? Because it was really exciting. I had um, a Gibson, like a starter amp, and it was solid state, and it was just, it was horrible. It was just a horrible, horrible sound. And this guitar I had as well, this like 20 quid Les Paul copy, remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it just sounded rotten. It was kind of depressing and there was a wee guy who lived in a street called Queenie and he asked me if I wanted to buy this fuzz pedal and I plugged it in and this wee crappy amp and this wee crappy guitar just all of a sudden it just sounded huge and we were brief like you know and both <laughs> very very excited we would we just thought oh my god this this pedal is like you know, a genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's what it was. You plugged that thing in and you didn't even need to play the guitar. It so just we, started going... And you thought, yeah, so I, I bought an Alfie Queenie for like eight quid and uh, and Queenie was going to book the, the neighbourhood laughing and saying that I was a sucker because I bought a broken pedal. And um, I didn't care, if, you know. They gave me like an eight quid pedal that gave me a, a career. Yeah, and a few months later he'd been watching you on he the tube board. He probably was with the same pedal that he was saying was broken. Uh, tell us about that, those first, you know, few months, that first year or so, super exciting, but probably terrifying as well. I mean, it should have been terrifying, but it, it kind of wasn't it, because we, we, I mean, we'd spent, like, years planning this band or talking about our band, and then suddenly it was happening. It was, it was incredibly exciting. It was like... You know, you're, you're you're a young guy and your fantasies have all just become real. 
So it wasn't time to stop and think. The only scary thing about it was I remember thinking, this could end next week. That was the most terrifying thing about it. The Mary chain came out fully formed, as far as we could tell. It just felt absolutely perfect from the, the lyrics to the, the noise, to the melodies, to the way you looked and dressed. You must have noticed at one point walking around Glasgow or Scotland or anywhere in the world, everyone looked like they could have been in the Jesus and Mary chain for a while. Well, we, we like to think we had an impact. Was it all planned? I mean, you, you came out perfectly formed. Did, it, did you have a master plan or was it kind of, this is what we like? Well, I mean, we used to sit up all night just, like, planning everything, not just, like, music. We used to... Do you remember? We used to sit yeah. with cups of tea and we'd imagine the perfect film or the perfect book or the perfect band, the perfect song. And we'd think, why don't people... It was all incredibly naive now that I look back on it. Well, you you realise now that, that that could never happen. And, it, and, you know, to change the world with rock and roll is not even you know, possible, but we at the time we sort of thought that subverting anything, anything you could get your hands on could possibly change the world. I think you can change the world with rock and roll. I think it's been done. Well, you can change entertainment with rock and roll, mm. but I don't think you can change. The world yeah. is, a, is a screwed up, horrible place, and it always has been, it always will be. I think you can make people's lives more bearable by creating anything, any great art. But the world just, like, chugs along no matter what. Yeah, but it never chugged along for me when I read that Daily Mirror thing where Johnny Rotten was saying that only suckers and losers, like, work in factories. And I read it while working in a factory. And then, like, I started thinking, maybe he's right. <laughs> and I thought, do I want to be a sheet metal worker? Not that like you're being a sucker or a loser being a sheet metal worker, but God damn it, I didn't want to be one, you know? The Jesus and Mary Chain definitely injected much-needed rock and roll musically and attitude-wise into the scene that was happening in the early to mid-80s. Do you remember when you came out, the enemy calling you the greatest band in the world, were there other bands that you felt kinship with that you liked? Most of the good bands were underneath the surface, like the birthday party and all of that. So you had to dig to find the good bands in the 80s. And, you know, and there were bands. There was like bands like, you know, Echo and the Bunny Men and the Cocteau Twins and stuff. Mary Chain was like a, an explosion. It was there. It had a seismic impact on lots of people. Were you kind of aware of how fast it was growing and, and how many people were getting into it? It seemed We seemed to be on the fast track. There was a feeling of sort of, uh, you know, is this going to keep going on like this? Is it going to, is it going to blow up next week? When the album uh, Psycho kind of came out, but it was definitely a great feeling, like, to put a record and have it, like, kind of instantly loved. And I think that plays like a greatest hit. You know, the, everything on it could have been a single. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of took a lot of people by surprise.
Well, there were, there were two gigs that we used to read about in the music press, and there were riots at these gigs, mm. bottles being thrown. Uh, from your perspective, not the journalist's perspective, what was it like to be creating that kind of tension at a gig? Uh, from one point of view, I can I remember thinking there's not many bands could get this kind of reaction, so I kind of enjoyed it. But then it was serious. They were actual riots, and, and I remember thinking somebody could get hurt or killed. Do, do we want that on our conscience? So, no, we didn't. So Well, I remember that you're talking about people getting hurt. These people were like, there was this huge, huge, like, speaker, and it was, like, about eight feet high, and they were going like this and toppling it, and there was people on, on, underneath. We didn't know what to make of it. But the weird thing is, and the bit that I didn't get, is that the audience wanted to kill us. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I remember there was one, but I think it was North London Poly. But I remember just sitting in the, just sort of kind of sitting, drinking a beer in the dressing room, and thinking to myself, if that door gives up, gives out, because they, they were trying to bash the door down to get to the band, and I was kind of thinking, you know, if the door, if it, if they get through that door, we we we're done for. And luckily the door didn't give it, give out. Yeah, you were named at that point the new Sex Pistols. Mm. As fans of the Sex Pistols, you must have quite enjoyed that as well. well that, that was, I, I, I mean, that was horrible because I thought you can never live up to that. Mm. So we immediately tried to nip that one in the bud. But you must have secretly gone, if we're creating the same kind of... Yeah, all right then. Yeah. <laughs> That album specifically, and I think Darklands, those first two albums have been hugely influential. Half the band sound like you guys 40 years ago. Does that does that give you a sort of feeling of vindication? I don't deny we've influenced people. Yeah, it's pretty good to know you've done that. The fact that we're still playing music 40 years later is talking about vindication. You know, nobody thought we'd still be around after all. We didn't think we'd still be playing after all this time. But we're here. There's still an audience and, you know, what does that tell you? Was there pressure after, like, the success of Psycho Candy and just you exploding onto the scene? Was there a pressure to follow that up? Yeah, especially as, like, everybody was kind of expecting that an album a year later. I, f I think the worst, the worst criticism we got was from my ma. My ma would phone me up and say like, like people are gonna forget you. But when are you putting out a record? And we say we're doing it, ma. We're doing it. We're writing. We're. It takes time, but people are gonna forget you. I remember hearing her saying that, and I remember thinking like she's right. People will forget you. Well, I've also got that feeling from from you, Jim, saying that we didn't want it to come to an end. Th that's the thing that I that, that that's all, that's ruined being in a band all of these years is the, also the feeling that this could be the last year. See if you could go back and tell yourself, your young self, don't worry. It's all going to be OK. You're going to be able to do this till you're into your 60s. You'd be able to just relax and go, oh, well, all right then, that's not so bad.
handy skin with the fire engines. It yeah. would be on, probably be on my Desert Island discs. First time I heard that on John Peel, I thought it was a wee band doing a cover version of a Velvet Underground song I'd never heard of. A Lou Reed song, and I thought, this is amazing. And then I found out it was a, a, bunch, a bunch of blokes from Edinburgh. <laughs> oh, it's one of the best records ever. Anything by the Pastels. But, um, well, yeah, we, we, we loved the Pastels then and still do now. I mean, we like to think there were bands that had, uh, you know, similar record collections to us, let's just say, you know, same kind of attitude towards making music as us, yeah. What about, it's the key question, and it'll be a question you'll always be asked till the end of your days, making music as brothers. Mm. Mm. <laughs> well, I, I mean, that's, that has its good, good points and bad points, really. I mean, the good thing is, it's like, you know, at the bottom, at the end of it all, we trust each other totally, so that helps enormously. I believe there's a song on the new album which has been playing on the programme, uh, J A M C O D, Jesus and Mary Jane O D. Thanks for not saying Jam Cod, because yeah. it really gets on my nerves. I, I can say imagine. Jam Cod all the time. <laughs> Why don't you just say to me, don't say Jam Cod? Mm. <laughs> on the, in the olden days, you know, it's in the studio, it would be like, that's too loud. No, that's too loud. Bring that, to, you know, something like that. And then suddenly a silly little tussle <laughs> would happen. Brothers say things that, you know, that, you know, and other people, observers, like sort of people in the room just kind of think, oh my God, should we be here? Should we leave? You know, and people tend to leave, you know. But the other thing is what it is, is like being in a band is a very claustrophobic environment. And there's, it's like there's only a, so much oxygen, and you, that's what you're fighting over. You're fighting over that oxygen. When the Gallagher brothers emerged a few years later, could you kind of see what was going on between the two of them? Absolutely. McGee always said that he'd, he knew how to handle the Gallaghers because he'd already been through it with the Reeds.
together and doing the band again was it kind of a realization this is what we do kind of yeah it was kind of like i mean when when the band broke up in 1998 I, honestly i mean that you know that eagles hell freezes over thing that that's the way it was i i could never have imagined being in the mary chain again because people used to say to me then oh you're going to get back together and i'd say absolutely not that that's never going to happen but when, when we finally got there, yeah, it felt like, you know, this is it. This is what we are supposed to do. And, like, not being in the Mary Chain, I, I always felt a bit like a spare part. I didn't know what to do with myself. Yeah, yeah same with me. Um, I remember going to see bands. I went to see, I remember I went to see the Breeders in L.A., one of the Breeders, and I said, where are you going next? And he was doing, like, Japan or something. And it made me feel like... Oh my God, I used to do this. I used to play in LA and then go to Japan and it made me feel like, you know, that I was, I was missing something because I, I guess around about there and I, yeah, we're both fathers and family men and uh, kind of semi-settled, but there was always that thing, like I miss going to Australia. Uh, I miss standing on a stage sometime. And... You came back and played to probably bigger audiences than yeah. you'd ever played to before. And, and it must have been slightly surreal playing Coachella, for example, with Scarlett Johansson uh, mm. joining you on stage. Well, I'll tell you, that was truly terrifying because um, we hadn't played for like nine years and we were, we were playing good in rehearsal and stuff. But we did a, the night before Coachella, we did this warm up show. And oh my God, remember it? Everything, mm -hmm. everything that could have went wrong. The night before this big, huge thing, just everything went wrong. Everything. The other thing, I mean, the reason I found it really hard to deal with is um, those were the first shows that I'd, that, that I'd played with American Sober. I mean, every single gig in the 80s and 90s, I was out of it to varying degrees, not falling over the place. I'd never done a gig without some kind of, you know, pick me up. And it, by that time, I'd, I was like something like three years sober. And it was just terrifying, mm. the thought of doing a sober gig. I didn't know whether I could do it or not. Do you know what I mean? I thought, my God, you know, I might have to run away. You know, see, but uh, the, the warm-up show went OK. But Coachella, I was, I, I was like that. I was like shaking mm -hmm. like a leaf. And I remember thinking I could just run. I could just run. I don't know if I can do this. I just really don't know if I can do it. What what will happen if I just run and never come back? Got through that 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 gig. Got through that, and it, and it, and it actually sort of found that I preferred playing sober. You did great, at Coachella. He was telling jokes and everything. It was like sixty thousand people, and I remember you you said, uh, "Are you having fun?" I was like, "Yeah." He goes, "Well, we'll we're about to change that." <laughs> I thought it was. Quite funny. You didn't look as nervous as you were. Put it that way. Do you remember any of the, the the sort of big gigs from the early days as well? I mean, remember the roller coaster tour with yeah. Dinosaur Junior and My Bloody Valentine and Blur. 
that I often wondered if you actually liked the other bands on the tour. We did. I mean, I mean, we chose the other band. We, we wouldn't have had any bands on it that we didn't like. Um, we discovered Blur, didn't we? <laughs> Blur were on their way down, and they did that, and then they were back on their way up again. I didn't enjoy it because I, I don't know. I, I think I was just in a bad place at that time. But I remember being constantly stressed out and uh, drinking a bit more than I ought to. And Lollapalooza was a big one for you in the States, I think. I mean, oh, God, that was that. That truly was horrible. Why? Why was that? On at two o'clock in the afternoon, broad daylight, after the going on after the band that have got the number one album in America. Pearl Jam, when the tour was booked, nobody had heard of them. By the time the tour hit the roads, they were number one in America. And they went, they went, out, they went out and played their show. Eddie Vedder was, like, climbing up on the, you know, the canopy above the stage, like a maniac jumping around. And then you, we actually tried to get it changed that we would go on before them, but they realised that, you know... It made them look good, really. So oh, mm. it made them look better when we come on afterwards, going, kind of going, oh god, <laughs> give us a chance, will you? And then the Chili Peppers, like we were, it was sold to us as a travelling democracy. And then the Chili Peppers had all of this extra PA shipped in, and he said, oh no, 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 but they're paying for it. And I said, well, can we pay for some? And for us, no. What about democracy? Shut up. That was mm. it. What do you listen to nowadays? Are there any new bands that you particularly like? Billie Eilish, she's pretty good. What do you want from me? Why don't you run from me? What are you wondering? What do you know? Why aren't you scared of me? Why do you care for me? When we all fall asleep, where do we go? Come here. Say it, spit it out. What is it exactly? The pain is the amount cleaning you out Am I satisfactory? Today I'm thinking about The things that are deadly The way I'm drinking you down Like I wanna drown Like I wanna end me Step on the glass Staple your tongue uh, Bury a friend Try to wake up uh, Cannibal class Killing the sun uh, Bury a friend I wanna end me What do you want from me? Why don't you run from me? What are you wondering? What do you know? Why aren't you scared of me? Why do you care for me when we all fall asleep? I, I have to say that I'm wildly out of touch. So am I. And I, but the thing is, though, I used to hate people that, that are like the way I am now. What it is is I've got thousands of records. I don't need any more. And then when you hear some new young band, you think, oh, they sound like Joy Division and the Bunny Men. I've got Joy Division and the Bunny Men records. I'll just listen to them. And it's probably horribly unfair, but it's just the way it is. I've got enough music to last me for the rest of my life. Mm. Billy Eilish is brilliant, though, isn't she? Yeah, she's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. What does punk rock mean to you nowadays, then? Punk rock was uh, the key to the kingdom. Are we still punk rockers? Is that what you mean? See, like, people get confused about what punk actually was. You get some people that think punk was a, a pair of Bonnie's trousers and a, and a spiky hair too. It's got nothing to do with punk. Punk was a kind of a, a way of approaching things. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know, jazz can be punk. And I was, you know, I was reminded the other day of a, a brilliant quote from uh, Miles Davis where he said something about, I can tell whether somebody can play just by the way they stand. Well, that's it. That's what punk's like. It's not about your haircut. It's not even about the sound. It's just about how you approach 
the making of the music or anything. Well, look, it's an absolute pleasure having you here. I am, I'm over the moon to chat to you guys. Jim and William, thank you very much. Thank it's been you. a pleasure. Yeah, Cheers. Girl, you got